specializing on business excellence. Before that, I was a lawyer. I left uh, my legal practice to join Dr. Goldred to do business excellence at Dr. Reddy's. We found some friends and formed a company. And uh, we started on the management consulting journey. It was a more of an entrepreneurship, both the, except me, everybody else was a working partner. So we formed a company. Now, the biggest challenge is in creating a consulting company is what are the skills people bring in? Is it friendship? Friendship doesn't work in management consulting. Maybe in business it works. But we identified that the who, who has what are management consulting expertise in different segments. Like I took over from marketing. But the others took over at the selling hey man, how and, are you? Uh, and excellence in operations. Uh, but what we found is we found out somebody and later on we found that he was actually planted by a, a, com a competitor. A partner was partner was planted by a competitor, and we had tough time. We broke up. We broke up. We ba we went bankrupt almost at some point of time, because the, the the competitor was playing as a partner partner with us. So when you are selecting a partner, please do check background check. <laughs> this is this is really happened. This is really happened. That partner was planted because we were seen as a threat to this company. And after breakup, we again joined each other, formed a great company, found the right people. We are hiring now MBAs. I teach at various B schools. I am finding right people from MB schools with right checkup. So now we are succeeding. We are having clients like Tata's, Godrej, uh, Sipla, Dr. Reddy's, and all those things. But when you are looking at partners, please be very, very careful about background check. They may be. They may be friends, but they, the, the friends may be friends of your competitor. Who knows? So we, 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 we won a very good success, then we were thrown out, we broke up, again we, we brought together. The two of us brought together and now we are running a very successful company. We got very good success. But that initial two years were very tough challenge because a competitor was a partner. Espionage. <laughs> All right, my name is Akhil. Uh, my question is actually to Rahul. Um, it's a question, it's not a comment or anything like that. Um, I, I completely agree with your point that companies usually succeed if they have co-founders with diverse you know, competencies or something like that. Uh, what I think, what the problem that I face sometimes for myself is there are some things that you know, there are some things that you don't know, and then there are some things that you don't know that you don't know, right? And when somebody tells you something that you don't know that you don't know, then you think that guy is smart because you know you don't know it. You don't know about it. Um, so let's say I meet somebody who seems to be of a background of you know competency that I'm looking for. Let's say an IT background, a hacker, somebody who's really good, which I'm not good at. Now he comes to my office and he tells me I've done, I've worked here, I've done this, X, Y, Z. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to be a CTO, and you know I can. That's sure. Great answer to it. Okay, and. You know, he shows me things that look really cool. I'm like, yeah, man, this is the guy. Like, you know, he showed me so many things that I don't know that I don't know, and this is the guy. And, you know, maybe he's not the guy. So how do I know? I mean, it might be a very point blank question. There's no checklist, but I'm just trying to understand. Uh, you know, so we see a lot of companies that tell us about stuff that they're doing, which I don't know, right? So, they, you know, I run into that situation as well. There's a lot of I don't know is going but, on. But I think you, you know, so, so I think when you're picking a co-founder, right, I think somebody talked about, you know, the notion of motivation, right? And their risk-taking appetite and their life stage. So one of the things you want to figure out is, you know, is aligned from uh, how much skin in the game is you willing to put in, right? And, you know, when I was looking to do a startup, I came back to India in 2005. I was running around trying to get a team together. I was the only monkey without a day job, right? Every one of my other co-founders had a day job. So to me, you know, that was a clear signal that this was not going to work out, right? So I think what you want to do is try and test, you know, what is their risk appetite? You know, how hungry are they? You know, if you did ask them to quit their day job, would they come on board? I think also looking for those signs beyond the knowledge. You know, at some point you'll need to go find an expert to help you pick yep. a guy. But just pick a pick the motivation. Yeah. Can I just speak for another second? Or not? No, let's just do no. questions and come Just one second. Just, okay. Can I speak? Yeah. 
Okay, so what my question is, yeah. What my question is primarily is I understand about the passion, right? Maybe he's really passionate, but about core competency, whether he can really build the application that I envision to build. So he might he might seem to me as a guy who has a lot of knowledge, who may be able to build what I want to build, and is really passionate about this idea, but maybe he doesn't have the skill set, right? So I'm just you know, yeah. because he doesn't know that's you know I think that's part of being an entrepreneur, right? Yeah. You will never have all the information. Exactly. So I think you have to take that leap of faith and if it goes wrong, fix it, right? Yeah. So nothing's permanent. So it but you know, move forward, others you'll be stuck. Yeah. Uh, can I can I add one can I add so one? Just, just give me one second. Uh, I have a funny needs to leave right now. Wait, just wait a second. So um, one of the things everybody is saying that we don't know how the end goal is gonna look like and as this companies start scaling up, all these equations start changing, right? So, Fanandar Sama, Red Plus, you, you've done about what, one crore ticket sales. Obviously, I, I can see that you've done scale, right? How has this co-founder and the equity person just changed? Okay, actually, I think when we started, we just kept it very simple. Uh, no questions asked. Uh, we had uh, three founders, three of us, one third, one third, one third. And we just got started. Uh, then after that, what happened was we ended up raising money. Our investor is here, the first investor. <laughs> so they came in. When they came in, they said, uh, here's your term sheet and here's your agreement. And when we saw that agreement, we almost fell, down, fell off our chair. Because it said, all your stock is not your stock. Right? Uh, they said, uh, I think this is for my panel. Right? Okay. Hello. <laughs> you can't be in two panels yeah, at the same time. <laughs> I've been a smash up. I'm just. Yeah. Uh, I'm in a smash up. Can I call you uh, in uh, five minutes and just one minute? So when we raise, sorry, uh, uh, so when we raise capital, uh, the investors came in and said, okay, all your stock is not your stock. And we said, what is this, right? And they said, uh, here's how it will invest over the next four years and et cetera and all. And uh, we asked a few others around us and they said, oh, this is how the investment works. And I said, okay, fine, if, it's, if that's how the investment works, let's just sign the agreement. And we did sign the agreement. And uh, what happened was, uh, there are a lot of other terms also, okay, what happens if one of the co-founder kind of meets with an accident and loses his limbs and arms, right? What happens, uh, will, his, will he get his uh, stock vested, will he not get vested and etc. and all. But I think that was a great document. We haven't thought about so many things as to what will happen if something goes wrong, what will happen if somebody contributes more, right? Or at least in his mind. Uh, but the document, I mean, didn't have an answer for the second, but it had answers for a lot of other natural calamities and etc. and all, and that was very good. So what happened uh, after that was, I think, uh, two years later, one of the co-founder said, oh, I want to leave because I want to explore outside this and etc. And then when he left, uh, what is vested to him is vested. What is not vested to him is not vested. And then what is not vested to him, uh, 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 one thing that we did, uh, I think, which is not part of the regular agreement, is said, okay, founder's stake is founder's stake. And in case any of the founder leaves, the stake that is not vested to him should be vested to the other founders and not to the investors, right? I think that was a very classic thing that we got there. And then when this founder left, the stake came to the other existing founders. So that's how our stake went up. And then I think tomorrow if I leave, my stake will go to the other founder and etc. So I think that was a very uh, nice uh, thing that has happened. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, can I if he kills here? me, if he kills me, my stock remains with me. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Can I add the point here? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Paresh Rajde. I'm a founder of Suvita Infoserve. Uh, it's a five-year-old company and I'm a serial entrepreneur, so this is my second venture right now. Uh, I have a little different point on this. Uh, uh, I, I was the sole uh, founder in the first case, as well as in the second case. That does not mean that I didn't found the co-founders. Uh, there was always there the opportunity. But what I did that, uh, you know, instead of having the co-founder and then the creating the chaos or some situations which happens in the future course, um, I say that I will not have a co-founder at all. However, I will have a people to whom I should give the equity in a such a way that growth path and everything is there. What does it mean? That today I have a people with me who are there from the first, uh, 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 you know, first company also and they are still there in the second company also. They have been there with me for almost 8-10 years and likewise. So it does not mean that you just have to be a co-founder and you get into the situation where you know you have some different uh, problem because having a co-founder has a more uh, chance of a litigation and other possibility. But if you are a founder and alone and you are the decision maker, I think that's one thing which is there. 
two, three advantage and pros and cons are always. Two, three advantage. One is that you are the visionary and you drive the business the way you want, right? So you are the sole decision maker, strategy maker, the visionary, the goal, and the way you want to drive the business going forward. So you did that. Other people align to your goal. And those who are not, they will go out. Those who are there, definitely they will walk through you and give them the equity, give them the benefits, give them the uh, growth path, give them the vision which you have driving and the people also buy that. And that's how I have seen that the people do value what opportunity you give it to them along the, the way that you grow. Today, uh, you know, it's a, as I said, it's a five-year-old company. We have raised almost 25 million over, over the three rounds of the investments. And the people have also valued those uh, teams which are there with us. So I think it's 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 more of an you know the uh, not necessary that you know, you have to if you are want to venture you need to have a multiple of people or co-founders to make a team. Not necessary. It's a risk which you want to take it up and you take it up. Not necessary that you should have a money. I didn't have a money when I started my first venture, and I didn't have again the money when I started second venture also. Because whatever the, I had the earn in the first one, uh, venture, which I exited well, I got uh, you know invested somewhere and likewise. So I think uh, yeah, you can uh, take a decision accordingly. You have a question. Yeah. Being seasoned entrepreneurs, it's a question taken one step backwards. Do you believe starting up in college would have been a bit more advantageous to you? Uh, okay. Let's let's just take a couple of questions. You you have a question? And we're just going to answer them in one shot. Yeah, because we what's need to wrap the probability up. of getting a, like if there is a single founder, what's the probability of getting a What's founder? the probability of success if it's yeah. a single founder? The success and getting founded both different. Okay. Any other questions? We'll take one more question. Anywhere from here? We have one question over there. All right. Uh, hi, I'm Piyush. So if I'm looking for uh, uh, the second startup, should I be a founder or should I look forward to become a co-founder? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So who wants to take? Take the first one. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Uh, the first question on uh, 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 would you have been better if you had started from campus? So uh, uh, just a small story. Uh, me and my friend, both of us, uh, uh, like we started after two years of working, whereas a friend of mine started right from the campus. And uh, when we started, he was like a senior to us. He's already done two years of startup. So when we started, we went to his office to see how it works, what happens, and etc. to learn from him. But when we went to his office, we were shocked. We were, and eventually he shut down the company and etc. and all. And I think one of the reasons why he had to shut down the company is because he has not seen how companies work. Straight out of the college, when he, I mean, his office, half of his office is his cubicle. And the rest of is where there are 20 engineers working in a very small place. And the outside his office room is a peon. It's a small startup, but he has a big cubic, a cube cabin, and he has a peon. And the 20 engineers who are working on software are in the rest of the half office. Okay? <laughs> he will not be able to attract talent. And I, I mean, he's a friend of mine, studied together for four years. I know he is not an egoistic guy. It's just ignorance. He just didn't know that today's open offices, the CEO also has the same office as anybody else and how does this whole thing work and etc. Probably the offices that he had seen is the offices of his uncles and etc. and all who run traditional businesses. And he set up a business like that, he couldn't attract good talent and uh, later on he just had to exit the business. And I think those are some subtle things. Like when I worked for two years, uh, I, I know this is how it works. So the first office is everybody is the same space, no, no preferential parking. Uh, if anything, we were much lower than all the other employees, right? Uh, and then things, and you start capturing things, uh, certain things like, okay, how does the, what does the HR team do? How does it work? Uh, when we say open office, why is it that the payroll team has a closed office, right? Uh, those are some things, and you take very confident decisions on those. Payroll has to have isolated this thing, HR has to have like this. What ha how, how does the appraisal work? Uh, what happens when you don't get a hike? How does the rumors work? Why does a person get demotivated? You see all these things which you have never been exposed to in those one, two years of experience. I mean, uh, my strong, strong advice has always been uh, get trained for free. Work for two years before you start up your own company, right? <laughs> yeah. So would you would you suggest that if somebody wants to start up, it's a good good start to go start, work for another startup, slightly along the maturity curve, so that you're not still learning all the mistakes, but kind of the best practices and things like that before you come along. 
I, I would say that a large company is uh, probably better because startup again uh, has a lot of misses. Uh, you don't know whether that's a usual practice. Like if you had worked for my friend, you would start believing that that's how the startup should be, right? So I would say that uh, go for a large established company, you'll know how things work there. Uh, yeah. So somebody once I met who basically said that uh, if you look at the life of an entrepreneur, the first company should never get funded. I think you're supposed to learn that revenue minus cost is equal to profit. The second company, you're supposed to build something to an exit. It doesn't have to be a brilliant exit. It just has to have money so that you go build your second one. And the third company is where you should actually get funded because you would know how to build a non-linear company, right? I know that Vivek has some thoughts on this. Uh, I know that he basically believes that there are a lot of 30 plus entrepreneurs who are actually building businesses and much more sustainable businesses and also VC based businesses. Do you want to comment on it? These are battles I've been fighting in Silicon Valley, most notably with Peter Thiel, who's giving uh, kids $100,000 to drop out of school. The assumption is that just because some young white kids at Y Combinator were able to build some companies to flip, everyone can do it. Those people at Y Combinator have an unfair advantage because you, it, this whole system is biased. Silicon Valley uh, mafia rules, mafia is the established system over there, and they can give some kids an unfair advantage, so they succeed and everyone thinks that that's the way to go. The right way is exactly the way it was described. Get some real world experience, finish your education, finish your degree. I know you don't have to get an MBA, an MBA is mostly useless when it comes to entrepreneurship, but um, at least finish your bachelor's degree and then learn on someone else's nickel or someone else's passa. I mean, let them fail, watch what they do right, watch what they do wrong, and then do it yourself. That's what I always recommend to my students. So, Rahul, the last question to you. If it was a single founder, would you fund them? So, so I'm, I'm also going to address the previous one, if you don't mind. I, I, you know, we agree the average age of our typical CEO is probably in his early to mid-30s, right? So I'm going to be very unpopular here with the younger crowd. But the fact is, we don't have the luxury for you to make mistakes on our time, right? So I'd love it if you made those mistakes before we write you a check. It's not to say you're not going to make more mistakes. We make mistakes all the time. But at least the basic stuff, you know, in terms of actually figuring out, if I give you $2 million, do you know what to do with it, right? And oftentimes, you know, I don't want to have you figure it out after giving you the money. So, you know, we do favor slightly more, and in India, actually, execution takes a big premium. I think in the US, when you can flip a company for 20 million, you're happy just to back a product. In India, if you're gonna build an organization, then you need a guy who's actually run a PNL, hired people, motivated people, can keep an organization growing, right? On the odds of kind of raising money as a single guy or as a team, I was just thinking about our portfolio. About 60% of our companies, we backed one guy, right? It was all about the guy. Another 30% was probably two people, and the exception is three. Anything more than three, I'm very worried about. So I would say the one company startup uh, tends to get funded, but it's also the hardest, right? Because when I look at the trade-offs these guys make as a single founder, it's immense. So, you know, obviously there's no, um, you know, once you have that bug, you know, can't, can't get rid of it, but be ready for those trade-offs. I've seen guys, their health goes to shit, their, you know, their, their marriages sometimes get rocky, they don't have time for their kids, you know, that's the trade-off in India, right? So I think as long as you guys recognize that, um, you know, just go for it. All right, so. Uh, you know, I was at NASCOM in November of last year. Vinod Khosla spoke before me. He was talking about how entrepreneurs basically die in terms of creativity when they're 35. I ripped him apart in the Washington Post, basically. I, it's complete nonsense. Even Vinod's companies, his most successful entrepreneurs are middle-aged. I researched this systematically. In the USA, we uh, uh, interviewed hundreds of entrepreneurs. The average age of a successful entrepreneur is 39. They have extensive experience before they start companies. These kids out of uh, Stanford, again, have an unfair advantage, but the average age is about what it is in this room. The average age in this room is about 39, 40. So you folks are the average entrepreneurs. So Vivek, is it yeah. possible that the Indian companies are killing people earlier? <laughs> <laughs> Could be, but uh, uh, you, you, know, you don't need that type of stupidity that comes with you. So you need the balance that comes with experience. Uh, I have a question. I wanted to ask. Uh, so no, no, well. we're not taking any more questions. No. We have to move to the next session. VC is going to kill me. So um, I hope you guys all enjoyed the session. Was it was it useful? Yes. yes. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Let's, let's move to the next talk. Yeah. How do you start? Uh, Kunal Shah from Free Charge. Are you guys the biggest free, free charge thing in India right now? Uh, 
biggest is a relative word. Okay. Uh, what did you say about the biggest? The biggest is a relative word. Uh, I guess uh, the operators who operate and actually own the businesses are the largest. How old are you? I'm 33. Uh, how old is the company? Two. Two years old. Yeah. And, Two and uh, so can you just walk us through the guidelines? I mean, like, when did you start? When did you get funded? I see that you guys have raised a ton of money. Mm, sure. So, uh, uh, I obviously was not the guy who jumped straight out of my college and started doing a startup. Uh, although I did join a startup when I uh, started in uh, 2000. Uh, and for me, it was... Uh, uh, a love for engineering, could not get into good colleges, so I decided to pursue graduation in philosophy. Uh, uh, and I still continue to work for a startup. I still was connected to internet at that point of time. Uh, that startup failed. Uh, I continued, the founders left. Uh, I pivoted the business from uh, e-commerce startup of pharma into a BPO, uh, which was for pharma, and then it was a BPO for healthcare. Uh, Came out of that and started this company, Axelist, uh, in somewhere in uh, 2009, uh, sometime, and uh, started with a company called as Pesa Back. Pesa Back was a, a mail-in rebate concept in India, and then pivoted the business to free charge. Okay. By the way, uh, we see there's a space here. A lot of people are standing. Please come. So, sure. Um, my name is Amir Hete. I am uh, one of the co-founders and partners of a company called Valuable Group. Uh, Valuable Group works in three verticals, media and entertainment, technology and infrastructure. And uh, at the core, we are basically a media and entertainment uh, and technology company. Uh, we operate various businesses. The one that we are most known by is a company called UFO Movies, where we take movies uh, and we digitally deliver them over satellite to theaters all around the country. We have about 4,500 theaters uh, around the country, and on an average, we contribute uh, about 70 to 80 percent of the box office collections of every given movie uh, on our platform. And we have various other other businesses. Uh, the hat that I'm, that I'm playing today is uh, as a managing director of a new startup company called Tipit dot Tipit that we've started, which is essentially addressing the hospitality space. Uh, we're uh, working towards controlling the experience that a consumer has for the hospitality industry overall, whether it be food and beverage or whether it be uh, hotels in, uh, in the room. Vivek, is that enough? <laughs> I think that's good. So let's try something a little different here. I think how many people have heard about uh, customer development, lean startup cycle, you know, go to customers early, all that you know, usual BS that people talk about. Everybody has heard about it. There are some people who haven't heard this philosophy yet. I have not. <laughs> so um, I want to take questions first, and then we can kind of steer people towards the conversation. Does that make more sense? Right? Because I think we might be over, over going the same conversations over again. How many people have questions about how do you hit how do you hit the market? I started my company. Is so Movie Trust India Private Limited? No, no, no. You no, just no. have to make the question. Have, the market is not ready yet because the market is not there as it is. There, there are two, three companies which are not working well. So I have to plan the marketing. Who are the potential people, the target audience which I can plan? Maybe my language is not sufficient for the entrepreneurial thing because I'm not from the entrepreneur. I'm from the film industry. So my language may be missing. But I now, right now, I'm targeting the audience. How I'm going to market my product, my films, to them through the different channel. Which channel is not set? They are not planned to see movies. Why on online? So now I'm creating the market. So that's a big, a big difficulty so for me. So how do you take a product to a market which is too ahead of its time? No, it's not too ahead of time. It's just that the other companies are just experimenting because so it's, a, it's a new market creation. It's a new market. Thing. All right. All right. Any other questions? What's behind you. Oh. How do you get the first like uh, 10,000, 20,000 users? Because consumer like, products uh, or business? Consumer product. Okay. Since it's an application and uh, uh, you don't get funding unless you have traction. And uh, how do you get traction? It's really difficult. Like, All right. We have been trying for four, three months. All right. Any other questions? There is one more question. When you're developing a new product, uh, typically we take a uh, customer feedback, right? So what is the right uh, size which should give you confidence that this is the right product you're building? Okay. What is the sample size that you should go after? 
Well, we uh, start a product based upon the gap holes in the industry system and probably to process it in that way. This is how we have started. And uh, yeah, what is the question? How do you start a product, right? Okay, how do you start a product? So, how did you start your product? Um, uh, talking about free charge, uh, what we have done uh, uh, for the Indian e-commerce industry is probably one of the few original ideas coming out of India. We are not a replica of a Western idea. Uh, uh, and the reason we were able to do that because we were not influenced by anything Western, uh, what we tried to solve as a problem was we realized while working for Pesa Back, Pesa Back was a cashback promotions company for a lot of offline retailers. What we noticed is uh, retail is all about sales is equal to footfalls into conversion into average ticket size. The two variables that could not change were average ticket size and conversion rate. Everyone pretty much could not control that. The only thing that could control, they could control was footfalls and they had to spend a lot of money uh, advertising and, and bringing a lot of people to do the footfalls. So what we realized is that free charge was a great model to create footfalls. Uh, we took the product that was actually selling the most, uh, recharge, uh, we're talking about 900 million connections, 98% of them being prepaid. Uh, and probably less than a percentage of them doing online recharge. We thought it was a great opportunity to use that, ride on that, create that as a footfall engine for other retailers to and marry this into a model. Uh, honestly, when I uh, went and pitched this model to operators as well as retailers, uh, I think it took me eight months to convince to get even one of them on board uh, because not a single guy believed that this is real. Uh, how can you marry Vodafone to a McDonald's, uh, to a Domino's, to a Pizza Hut coming on single platform? So on a single Single row, I have Barista Cafe Coffee Day, and second row, I have Domino's Pizza Hut and Papa John's. Like they're not uh, totally understanding the concept. So when we told them it's a platform play, people will come. So uh, I don't think there is a, a way you can uh, uh, work with the model. You have to think of something that you believe as a customer. Fortunately for me, I did not have to unlearn anything because I did not come from e-commerce, marketing, telecom, advertising, or retail. Do you right? think? Do you think there's unlearning to be done in e-commerce? I think a lot. Uh, 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 I had written an article uh, on, on Plugged In uh, about uh, why Indians don't buy online. I think Indians are just not used to self-service. We love to be pampered. Uh, we, we, I have to be assisted, right? Uh, Western markets, they were already trained for self-service. They knew what is add to cart. If you do a survey and ask 90% of Indians what is add to cart, they don't know what is add to cart, right? Oh, they knew add to cart and check out. You tell them check out in India, they don't know what is check out. So why do we use these words in India? So I think there's a lot of unlearning to be done. Uh, uh, we copy models, unfortunately. We don't Indianize them. Uh, we we call means our site is of two pages. I'm beginning it to a one page website right now. There's any page views SEO. I, I don't think so. We, we do uh, probably uh, the same amount of transactions or more transactions than what Redbus does or Bookmyshow does today. Uh, but we do not have to have these page views and SEO should do that. So there are uh, these standard theories that work, uh, but you can just create your own model, which you don't have to follow a lot of these things. Yes, you have to follow the hygiene of these things. But you have to take these uh, uh, learnings from that. And, and is everybody following what he's saying? Or, or do we need to like slow this down a little bit? <laughs> well, there is no time to slow down. The India is running very fast. You guys have to catch up. Uh, I can tell you one thing. Uh, India is at a tipping point for e-commerce. Uh, not the way it is done today, but a lot of business models are doing some very interesting things and they're getting traction. They're not the guys who are got funded. They're not so, the so guys. I'm going to catch you at the board. Sure. So somebody basically asked, how do you get your... So whom did you try to convince first? And, and be honest with me. Yeah. Did you try to convince an investor or did you try to convince a customer? Uh, we never ever went to an investor. Why not? What is wrong uh, with you? Uh, eight, nine months into our journey, uh, we were approached by 10 to 12 investors. Okay. Uh, we finally met one and probably just signed up with them because I had no concept. I remember a question being asked in the meeting, what is your CAC? And uh, CAC is one, it's called customer acquisition cost for guys who don't know. Honestly, I did not know what was customer acquisition cost because I had not spent a single rupee uh, on marketing till date and I was already doing like 6,000 transactions a day at that time. Uh, I had not spent any monies on marketing. Uh, so how do you get your first 10,000 customers? Yeah, so uh, I have a... Uh, I did not follow all the rules to get my customers, so I'll, I'll talk about what we did to get our first thousand customers. Anything uh, which is verging on illegal is more acceptable. Yeah, so uh, this room is chamber, so it's all, all open over here. Uh, what we did is uh, our first 500 customers actually came through uh, doing some lot of smart social media. We had two or three fake profiles uh, uh, of uh, women who were not real. 
and they had managed to get 5,000 friends uh, 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 over a period of one month just by being there. Uh, uh, and uh, one fine day they uh, announced that, hey guys, uh, look at freecharge.n, looks like a pretty interesting site. Uh, has anyone tried it? Uh, and that time we had five operators and two coupons on our site. We did not get the major operators to agree to be part of our journey. Uh, so when we launched it, uh, we got 200 comments. Uh, uh, this was Neha Singh's profile. Uh, 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 and, and 198 comments were, oh, this is total scam. Uh, they're going to loot your money. Uh, don't try this. There's nothing like free. Uh, don't even try all these things. And there were two positive comments. That was me and my colleague in the office. Uh, 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 but we realized, we were very depressed uh, at that point of time, we realized that, oh God, we've created something, no one's going to ever use it. It's, it's a scam. How can recharge be free? How can you get equal value coupons and all of that? Uh, but what happened for us is, uh, it was a good problem to solve, right? So when we get a lot of people, so we went actually to some campuses and IITs and all that, and we actually told them to transact and give their uh, feedback on social media about trying the site. So uh, for us, the first few transactions came through friends and families. Uh, uh, then what happened is one day a, a reader's journalist uh, actually uh, uh, transacted on the site, got the coupons, and he wrote to us through his Gmail ID, Gmail ID, that uh, why don't you talk about your journey and uh, uh, give us some details about your thing and share some pictures of your team. And we were like, kya farak padta hai? Was it, was it a picture of Neha Singh? Uh, no, so Neha Singh was never mentioned uh, uh, except this room. We, we don't talk about Neha Singh. Uh, uh, so we, 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 we got this article and then as soon as that article came, it came to the home page of uh, uh, Rediff and we never looked back from there. That's where then we started hitting 1,000 transactions per day and, and it kind of... So that's your, there. there's your question. Uh, answer. In a way, I think... Uh, 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 there are no, there are no uh, uh, right ways to do it. What I would really advise is don't spend marketing dollars to acquire 10,000 customers. You are not getting your business model right if you're doing that. Good point. All right, so you're, you're in the B2B business. I, I think Neha Singh is sending him a lawsuit right now. <laughs> yes, I think uh, my question is more so towards, uh, is everybody trying to do an e-commerce based business predominantly or are we talking about specific real products uh, and services uh, out in the field? Because I think there's no standard answer, uh, is the first thing that I'd like to say. Uh, how many people here are trying to build an e-commerce company? Please don't raise hands, please don't raise hands, please don't raise hands. <laughs> Excellent. So three. Actually, I'm just kidding. How, how many, is there, is there any other people who are basically building e-commerce companies? You build, oh, okay. There are four, five of them here. They're at least behind me, why? Okay, so but there, are, there are people who are building. So I, think, I guess, so guess this. What, what I really would like to understand is what are the rest of the people who are sitting here, you know, because there's nobody building products and nobody building e-commerce companies. I think most of the people are just uh, listening. So my my question, uh, to, to answer the question about really customer acquisition, uh, I think you... So, you so let's start it. with something else. He basically said, how do you find a problem to solve? How did you come up with your problem to solve? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> Because I see a lot of entrepreneurs pitch their solution to me without even pitching us a problem to me. So how do you find a problem to solve? I think uh, my, my personal opinion is that uh, products that succeed are predominantly ones that fill a gap and add a value. Now, so, adding so a value is a very You can't give me uh, You have to tell me how you found your problem. So I'll tell you as an example, uh, you, you heard Mr. Parish Raj, they speak before, who essentially started a company um, uh, selling lottery tickets. Okay, that's how our, our, origin, our origin, original start was. was providing a lottery platform for lottery operators because um, in India, every business has really been formed mimicking uh, an, a Western business of sorts. You heard uh, uh, him talk about really how we mimic ch checkout and, uh, and, and things like that. Basically, it's a mimic. If it works uh, outside of the country, uh, in the Western regions, it should work here. Unfortunately, that's not how things work within India. Uh, there, are, there are real uh, material business problems here that are very different than the way some of the Western countries work for the, for the most part. So when we first started, we started by aggregating lottery operators and providing a point of sale solution, which was working across various topologies, whether it was GPRS, there was no real broadband at that time, VSATs uh, across the board. Um, and lottery was a very, um, it was a trade which was very regulated. It was really not something that we really looked at. We were not operating lotteries, but we were providing the technical infrastructure to operate lotteries for that matter. We were, we were the, the platform operating it. Um, so we took an exit out of, out of that particular business and 
we decided that the, uh, we needed to leverage our core skill set, which was what we had formed, which was essentially being able to transport data in a very finite footprint across the board. Uh, there are many companies that were valid lottery companies from all over the world that failed in the country. Uh, my partner's name is Sanjay Gaikwad. Uh, he started Playwin. If you're familiar with Playwin, Playwin was actually founded by Sanjay Gaikwad for, for Subhashi. Uh, so, uh, for the most part, um, what you need to really do to answer, to make a long story short, is really to, uh, if you don't know what the problem is, I don't know what you're trying to do set establishing a business, quite frankly. Uh, you need to understand what is the gap and what is the, the problem that you're trying to address before you come out with the product. The second aspect of how you get the, uh, get the product, a product cannot be to replace uh, an existing pie. Uh, it cannot be to take value away from somebody who's having it. I'll give you as an example. When we first started UFO movies, um, the biggest challenge was who's essentially going to pay us because we are going to be digitizing this, these movies, um, taking them uh, over the satellite and delivering them to the theaters. Um, in the West, digital cinema was a failed concept. All the studios tried to actually push digital cinema and they failed. The reason they failed was they said that we'll create a specification. Towards the specification, the product development companies like Sony, Panasonic, and of the world, they'll make a product and they'll figure out how to sell the product. So they, as an industry, started working towards digital cinema. Unfortunately, the Sonys, when they built a product to the specification that the studios had made, made a $200,000 product. So a $200,000 product being sold to a theater, the theater uh, looked at that and said, wait a second, this is not going to bring in new customers because I'm digital. I have the access to the, the, the films already uh, from a, in a physical form, so what is it that that's going to do? Qualitative difference is not going to bring me more money. I'm not going to be able to charge him more for that matter. So at the end of the day, here was all this development that was done, uh, DCI systems created, and nobody to buy them. So the digital cinema business actually failed in the Western countries. We made it successful here because the value proposition and the market dynamic here within India is completely different than what it is elsewhere. Here, uh, I'll give you as an example. Uh, there, the cost of distribution of movies as a cost of, as a proportion of cost of, dis uh, of the content by itself is very low. Two thousand dollars to make a print is not a big, not a big cost. Here, on an average, a movie cost is about six crores, for that matter. We make a thousand movies a year. So, at the end of the day, if you had to spend two thousand dollars in making a print and taking a movie with a widespread release, which at that time was 250, 300 theaters simultaneously. Uh, you were talking about making a significant value proposition, so a value arbitrage that we're bringing to the industry. So, so there are two things that I'm, I'm, one very interesting thing I'm hearing. You're actually saying there are a lot of people trying to imitate the US, which is not really working in India. Yeah. You're telling me that India is a very u unique market. So are you telling me that all the people who are coming back from the US and saying, uh, so back in the US, this is how we do things and trying to build companies are all bullshitting? Not at all. Um, what I'm saying is, uh, all the people who are coming back to the country, I myself am one of them, okay? I, think we <laughs> I, I worked, I worked uh, um, in the US for about 11 years before we started Valuable Group. Um, this is actually going back to the previous segment. Uh, you have to learn from mistakes. Yeah. That's, that's really what makes I, I you... I know what ground reality is before you import something. Exactly. Things. And why, why make mistakes on your own account, on your own money? You should make mistakes on somebody else's account and learn from them and actually bring them and you and put them into application when you're starting something of your own. That's essentially what we've been doing across the board. So essentially it's not it's not that all the, 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 the people that are making the money within the, the US are not. I run and operate a business also in the US for that matter. <laughs> but at the, at the same time we have to understand that the product that you're trying to do has to be relevant to the market that you're trying to sell it in. Okay, I think that's a good point to stop at. So Rahul, I have an interesting question for you. This is kind of from a conversation that we had a long time ago. Um, you have quite a few companies in your portfolio which are in the e-commerce space leveraging the web and there are some very, very interesting companies. And I know that you uh, one of the statements that you made was that there are some fabulous things that can be done in e-commerce. We are not even at the, at the verge of it, right? So can you talk a little bit about what's going on in the e-commerce yeah. space? Um, Sorry. Maybe uh, not all of it is adaptable sure, to sure. India, but... So, you know, I, 
So we've not done that many investments in e-commerce in India, ironically. Uh, we have just one company and I think it really addresses sort of the heart of the opportunity, which is either range or reach, right? And so we backed a company called Naptol uh, a few years ago. And the fundamental proposition was, let's get product to customers who can't come to the big cities, right? And so fast forward to 2012, we do hundreds of crores of business and 80% of our orders are from outside the top 20 cities, right? So fundamentally, you know, I think we were attacking the heart of the organized retail problem, which is it just can't get to these customers. Now, in order to do that, we had to take on the challenge of working with the Indian Post Office, right? 50% of our orders actually go through the Indian Post. And that's a staggering number if you think about it, right? Do they get lost? Well, so here's the beauty. From the time it leaves our office to the time we get a check back from the Indian Postal Service, it's 15 days. That's the Indian government writing you a check in 15 days, right? Now, if you can crack that puzzle, it's infinitely scalable, right? So I think to the point of saying, you know, what are the lessons we've learned from the US? One of the things people didn't hear about Amazon is they cracked how to use the US Postal Service, right? And I think that's really what gave them leverage while everyone was trying to figure out logistics. We're not trying to build another FedEx in India. It's really, really expensive. It's really, really hard. We've got a FedEx 10 times as bigger. It's called the Indian Post. If you can figure out how to leverage that, you can build scale, right? So, so, so what I, other opportunities would you look at? So, you know, we also attack the challenge of, you know, the single-minded motivation of most parents is getting your kids married, right? And we said, look, focus on big problems, right? So we backed Bharat Matrimony, because we knew that, you know, fundamentally, the classifieds is inefficient, right? And moreover, as more and more people adopt the web for doing things beyond utility, they're gonna look for solutions that are relevant to life. So, you know, we backed Bharat Matrimony and, and God bless them. They've done fantastically well, and hopefully they'll be at some time a public company. So What's I think happening they, in the U.S. that you don't see happening in India. So I think the U.S. has evolved to a whole notion of shopping as an experience, right? I think the trend that we're seeing there is not about product availability, right? That's hygiene. I think where we see things happening now is all about can you marry shopping and an experience? Can you marry curation and social, right? So we backed a company. Uh, about six months ago, and what they do is bizarre. You know, they work with um, largely with women who have luxury merchandise and don't know what to do with it. So this woman actually is the founder of Pets.com. You remember that company? So she started this business. Said there's billions of dollars of merchandise that was sold in the last five years that's sitting in people's closets. If I can become the eBay of luxury merchandise, I'm going to win. And so we put this thing together six months ago. We've gotten up to doing you know, tens of millions of dollars of revenue already. Jack Welch's wife sells her stuff to us, and then we sell that on into the market, right? So the US is a different, you know, it's a different ball game. And you know, for all of us who think e-commerce is done, man, it's, it's here forever, right? So don't, you know, this, what we're going through right now, there's a bit of lull in financing. You know, people think the world's gonna come to an end. Sure, there will be some consolidation. Not every two-bit business deserves to survive. But if you're gonna stay focused on commerce, you know, think long-term, recognize that India is probably five to seven years behind consumer behavior-wise, right? And build for where the consumer is today, not where the US consumer is today. So, um, I'm gonna come back to you. Um, so as an entrepreneur, one of the biggest problems is that you can't stop your brains from firing new ideas. Sure. So I'm sure you, you come across a few ideas and, and thought to yourself, you know, if, I had, if my investors did not bolt me to the ground and say, ask me to focus on one company, these are three ideas that I've been working on. Correct. I, I guess uh, that's the biggest challenge any entrepreneur would have uh, after they've implemented one thing right. Uh, they start getting uh, these unlimited ideas and they start <laughs> Uh, I think they, they just get a skill of seeing problems. I think India, in general, what we lack, I, I have been to engineering colleges for workshops on entrepreneurship, so I tell them to write down five problems that they know around their life. They can't write five problems, right? They can't see five problems around them. Yes, the audience. Actually, that's the biggest problem. If someone did a startup of just writing down problems what we have in India and let them be solved, it would be a brilliant startup by itself. Uh, it's just that we cannot define problems well. We cannot see problems well. I think what entrepreneurs start doing after doing one thing right is they start seeing and start defining problems better and they can marry two, three different things. I can learn something from UFO and pick up something from free charge and create something third. So, so that is a funny bit. I was actually uh, telling somebody that 
the fundamental premise of an engineer is to understand a problem first, right? And we are a country of engineers, which is the irony. I, right? should, I, should, I should clarify what happens in the engineering in this country. Uh, yeah, let's not go there. Let's no, no, I, I have to talk ideas. about that. I have to talk about that. Because what, what happens in engineering for our kids over here is that we spend so much time in books that the world around us is totally missed. When I meet these kids and I talk about okay, what do you see around, what do you see problems, they, they are so much into their books and kind of over pampered to really be uh, uh, conditioned to succeed to get an engineering seat, uh, they have missed the skill of trying to learn real life problems. Uh, Yes, when we tell them real life problems, they can come up with great ideas. That's a good thing about, means if you define the problem for them. So I'll tell you with our engineering team and we tell them, oh, uh, we need to, we just tell them, oh, I need to get 4% more success rate out of this, do whatever you have to do, uh, then magical stuff happens. But if you tell them, oh, we need to uh, look at uh, trying to solve a bigger thing and give a bigger macro view, it doesn't really work. So uh, coming to your point of, of controlling uh, ideas for entrepreneurs, I think uh, it's the biggest discipline one needs to have. Uh, and it, it takes a lot of conditioning for entrepreneurs to not get tempted into doing 10 different things, uh, which may make sense. But at the same time, they should be also very clear that uh, it might be important to pivot the business at the right time. Uh, some of those ideas may be good to experiment on the side, uh, which may be uh, key to the pivot that you will do for your business in the so, next. So blow our minds away. Tell us two problems that you think that needs to be solved. Uh, uh, so this just, is your test, by the way. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I always up for it. Uh, I did not do good in my test in my uh, college days, so I, I love doing this. Uh, your uh, next round investor might be sitting here. <laughs> that, that's fine. Uh, uh, the, 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 the thing that we have in this country is uh, we have 20 million credit cards. We have 300 million debit cards. Uh, only 10 million of those debit cards are ever swiped for doing either an online or offline transaction. There are 290 million debit cards, 90% uh, of them which are just primarily used to go to an ATM. ATM for a bank is a cost. Every time you visit an ATM, a bank incurs a cost versus when you go to a POS machine or go to an online site, that's some amount of profit to them. Uh, uh, we need to create an opportunity, and I'm not talking about the generic e-commerce. We are talking. We need to create some real opportunities for these debit cards to come into the ecosystem. That's a big problem to solve, right? Uh, we, no one has found the answer. There are a lot of companies, including RBI, trying to push this. Uh, RBI publishes data on their site about uh, how many cards issued every month and how many transactions. So, uh, on an average, 0.02 transactions per card are happening today in this country. Uh, 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 that's the opportunity. Uh, this is just one big. For somebody who's not so good at uh, education, you have some crazy math. No, it, it's it's simple stuff. I just want to jump into that. Uh, he mentioned about the debit card. Okay, so he was just mentioning about the debit cards and credit cards, like how uh, people are comfortable going to ATMs and withdrawing money and then going out to spend. So what we have done is we've actually tried to identify this problem with the past three months, and uh, we've just developed Can a new you application. Yourself? What do you do? What's Sorry, your name? Uh, my name is Rana Kemdev, and uh, we've co-founded a mobile app called Contact Diaries. So what this helps people do is when you go into places like restaurants and shops and you check in, we tell you what offers are going on on your debit or credit card so which in a case will encourage you to use the debit credit card at that moment as opposed to moving around finding atms to withdraw cash all the time okay so we're not going to go to solutions yet you have to tell me the second big problem yeah, uh, uh, coming to uh, uh, just uh, uh, real problems in india like uh, uh, we talk about uh, uh, there is a, a large e-commerce company which is called ircTC uh, uh, they do probably five, six lakh transactions a day. The number two e-commerce site is not known, uh, but I don't think it's more than 50,000, 60,000, 70,000 transactions a day. There's a big gap over there. We keep saying that uh, uh, the customers are not there to transact online, and we, uh, as entrepreneurs, I think we are all contributing to this whole idea that, oh, most customers don't transact online. Uh, I think uh, uh, talking about you know, what, what he's done with Tidbet is, is trying to solve a real problem, right? Uh, I can, uh, uh, what I'm saying is there are a lot of these India problems problems around the daily life needs uh, that we have uh, and converting that into payments. Uh, uh, I'll tell you an example of uh, uh 
uh, there's a company which does money transfer for maids uh, to their things. Uh, none of us have, have created a method to actually uh, uh, address our uh, uh, lower cost income to be not pay by paid by cash, right? If any solution was created where you can kind of aggregate this whole thing and uh, pay your driver, pay your maids through an ecosystem directly into this, uh, that could be an interesting problem to solve, uh, 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 again, towards payments, uh, but getting inclusion for a lot of these guys. So uh, I'm just trying to say that there are big opportunities. We talk about 120 million users, internet, and, and other things that are larger audiences around us uh, in metro cities. Uh, interesting thing about Naptol he mentioned about us, uh, and just across e-commerce, I've seen 70 to 80 percent come business coming out of tier two, tier three. They are doing this because it's like US. You are so away from your retail store, it might as well just get it online. Uh, today, I don't think anyone, uh, how many of you actually buy stuff online once a month? I can see 30% yeah, in this room, right? Uh, uh, this is urban India. We don't need e-commerce. I, I, I can order a Samsung Galaxy Note on credit. Have you tried driving on the road? Oh, I don't need to. I just talked about that. I, I can get a Galaxy Note in five hours at my doorstep, pay them after five days at a better rate than e-commerce in Mumbai. E-commerce is not required for the people in urban India. Uh, I guess we are absolutely spoiled, right? Uh, uh, we don't need to do much to get all of these things done. But there are a lot of these problems that the urban India faces, like driving. Uh, I do not want to drive. Uh, can you create some solutions around that which makes my life easier, right? So there are interesting things that could be done around that. Uh, urban India, tier 2 India, tier 3 India is all behaving differently. Uh, we, we call it same India, but they have very different requirements. Uh, E-commerce, I can say, is thriving from tier two to tier three because they don't have access to these brands. They don't have uh, the access to a lot of these uh, things which we in, in, in metros don't really care about. So, so we're going to go into two big points, right? Uh, uh, I think the two things that we're going to talk about is traction and the P-word. You also talked about something called K-quotient, which I have no clue about. Yeah, yeah, uh, we're going to come to that later. So uh, traction, when you look at a consumer company, you know, B2C company, uh, and uh, by the way, first of all, you need to answer if you think what he's uh, talking about problems are real yeah. problems. So, so we actually backed a company <laughs> that solves that problem, we think. Uh, and I'm going to plug it for two minutes. It's called Loyalty Rewards. We have 180 million debit cards on that platform. And month on month, we're actually having a significant impact on spends. We've so far accumulated about 100 crores of redemption cash for these users because we're encouraging them to take out their, ca their card and use it at point of sale. So we think it's a huge problem. We love the problem. We're trying to solve it at Loyalty Rewards. So we're, we're backing an opportunity there. So excellent. So we're going to take a small break and basically throw it to the audience, right? In terms of identifying a problem, what is your question? Do anybody have questions in terms of identifying problems? No? It's not about the identification of the problem, but the, uh, the way we go to solve the problem is the main thing which uh, uh, I heard of about the common thing about virtual cash. And if virtual cash is made into reality, e-commerce is going to boom like anything and the number of services which are connected will be much more. So the scalability gap is going to be a huge. Uh, the regulations in money would be the uh, big problem and uh, connected services. Let's, let's come, we'll come to that later. So I think he's talking about the execution risk. We'll, we'll come to that later on. Um, does anybody have any problems? You know, how do you find a problem? It's actually a question to Rahul. So, being an investor, you might have come across some companies. The biggest problem for cards is basically you're giving out the whole bank account information. Unlike a cash note, a thousand rupee note, even if I lose it, I lose just a thousand rupees. But if I lose the in, uh, credit card information, I lose all the amount in the credit card. So is there a company actually working to create such a system where you have, suppose if you lose information or credit card, you will actually lose that much amount only, like 1,000 rupees or 2,000 rupees, and nothing more than that. So is there any company in your know-how doing some, something like this? 
He's talking about an insurance. Yeah, well, uh, partly insurance, partly, you know, what the government is trying to do is move to two-factor. So even going forward on a credit card, you'll be required to enter a PIN. That's already happened right now. So you see a lot of these new cards will be issued with a chip in them. So what's going to happen in the next few years is every point-of-sale terminal will actually be upgraded to a chip and PIN. So when you make a credit card transaction, that second factor authentication, which is a PIN, which a guy who steals your card may not know, that's meant to curb that fraud. So, you know, there is mechanisms in place from a security standpoint that limit the amount of abuse. But if somebody's going to steal your card and somehow figures out your PIN, you know, the only thing that will happen is the systems in these, these the payment gateways should pick that up, right? But, and, uh, but people say that that's the biggest reason why e-commerce is not picking up, because there's a two uh, yeah, I, I, Look, I think that's an execution problem, right? Because if you can have a bunch of handoffs and, you know, you need to pop up a verified by Visa page and that's a broken experience. I, I agree. I think it is a broken experience. So if somehow magically you can solve the wallet problem and you can keep a funded wallet and that's the next business we're going to fund is if we can find a way who can, somebody who can actually attack the, the problem of a more elegant checkout, I think that's an opportunity to be solved. Uh, Rahul, I would uh, just pitch in on a moment. Uh, uh, well, I use HDFC Bank. They have this feature there. You can generate a credit card online. By the way, this is not a c consumer, you know, banking consumer. <laughs> no, form. not at all. Not at all. So I'm just answering his question. There are solutions. There are solutions. For example, HDFC Bank. What they do? You go there onto their website, generate a credit card that is valid for a couple of days, and it has a fixed denomination. For example, thousand rupees. And so you lose, then you lose only thousand rupees. So solutions exist. It's just that. It has not been marketed so well. The fact that we have so many solutions that exist, consumers are super confused. They don't know what to do. Uh, the country does not need 20 non-standardized solutions. Uh, I'll tell you what, we did a survey and found out that why people don't use debit card. Most people don't know that debit card is a debit card. They, they call it ATM card. How many of you call it ATM card? What is there in your wallet right now? Or call it debit card, right? It's ATM card for, the, for most people, right? They don't know that ATM card has to be doing something else. It's like trying to say, oh, the toothbrush can also open up my door. I mean, it's, it's, it's just trying to you know, uh, change the positioning over here. Right? I have seen that customers uh, get super confused. We are engineers trying to create these great idea solutions, 5,000 rupees card, uh, double checkout, two-factor, VBV. The consumers are thoroughly confused, right? Uh, I was talking to uh, some, someone about wallet, right? I mean, there are large operators launching these products. I asked them, I ask, I mean, I keep doing this focus group and I ask them, what do you understand out of this? Like, I don't know, I showed the ad that the money was paid. You now, who's supposed to use it? Who's the PG? Because they show some uh, great youth of urban India doing this service when it's supposed to be solving the unbanked problem. How is this connecting these things? So I think uh, the solutions need to be simple. Uh, I, I, I keep telling my team that we need don't, don't need to make simple UIs. We need to make dumb-proof UIs. Uh, uh, that's what's going to work. ATM is a classic example of it, right? We, we, we got a whole of India to move to uh, do ATM transactions. Now we're trying them to move to POS. Make it simple. Don't don't try to create these 5,000, 4,000. Security is the thing. Then why is IRCTC doing 5 lakh transactions a day? If security was a concern, it's by the way, uh, the best UI experience you can have. Uh, 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 and still, it works. You are joking, right? Yeah. <laughs> you did not see the smirk that I had. I can't. <laughs> 8 o'clock to 8.30, that car. <laughs> so what does traction mean for you, by the way? It's a fancy word. Did, did, did you get funded? <laughs> been funded yes so yeah. what what did investors mean by traction what did you as an entrepreneur define as traction when did you know that this is the business this is a business right that I can completely back because there is an opportunity cost behind can it. I answer some other questions <laughs> no I think we need to keep moving on this because I had to do I'm kidding I was just kidding about that no. No, I think uh, we cannot talk about IRCTC no we're not talking about IRCTC <laughs> no see traction um, I'm really talking, going to fundamentals for the most part, really, uh, because I believe that business fundamentals essentially are the one that build sustainable businesses across the board. And this may seem like a lot of horseshit. Should we ask the audience <laughs> what, what they understand as traction? Let's do that. So, so what do you guys, what, what have investors and what have people told you what traction means? Let's start with a consumer company. What have they told you that 
you have to have this many users before you can say that you have traction. How many? They said users are high ticket of engagement. So what is the ballpark? What do they say? 500, 300, 200, 20,000? I got uh, a number this morning. I, 500, I okay, could not answer that. Okay. <laughs> so they, they, are, they are very, very vague no, with you. What I've seen is that they measure it in terms of because by probably at say different stages, traction means differently. It doesn't necessarily mean. So let's say early stage. You are a B2C customer. Huh. When would you define that you have cast traction? When I have to engage with it. Excellent. So, number of traffic that is coming back, 30% coming back. Okay? So, I'll tell you, uh, my name is Manav Shankar, and I run a company called MiraLocker.com. Right? We are into S commerce, a lot of e commerce, e commerce companies. So, you have to define commerce. what traction Traction, uh, see, uh, we have been to, uh, we have been uh, going on reaching investors. Some of them uh, say, okay, let's build traction, then come to us. We are reaching about 1,000 customers uh, a month. And we were told about first to reach 500 numbers. So I take it as a soft reject under with somebody. And if we have got really, really, really big traction, I'm sure it will come to us. If the, if the traction is substantially big so enough. So what do you understand that they want? I think that's a soft reject. Somebody is not interested in the business. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> What do you think? Traction is basically uh, the expenses minus the income, but the number of people that you need to get your growth going organically, if uh, if at all... So I mean, what does it mean? If, it if, if, you're, uh, if you're getting high margins on your product, then you need fewer people to get your traction. You can't have the whole world paying a huge amount so, of money. So, so the traction is... Uh, the profitable. Minimum, the, yeah, yeah, the minimum number of people that need to know, that need to be engaged for your product to be uh, profitable. sustainable. Yeah. Okay, what else? What else? Come on. How many people think that traction for a consumer web company means 10,000 users? Higher? Lower? 1,000? Am I getting lost here? No. Uh, what do you think? I don't think, but I, I got an answer this morning that you need to have at least 500,000 users talking. Uh, you know, uh, if you have that, then you solve all that attraction and then come to us. So, so from a B two B perspective, what would you say as traction? See, I'll, uh, I, I, is the question relevant to startups walking up to investors and being funded? Is that the is that the answer, is that the basis of the question? How many people are here looking to raise funds? How many people do plan to raise funds in the next six months, eight months, twelve months? Okay. And are you facing the question of traction? Yeah, yeah. Wait. Except that nobody knows what traction means. So, uh, uh, could, I, could I ask a question to you actually? Yeah, maybe yes. like, this, this yeah. helps uh, answer sure. the, the, the dilemma. So, as investors, maybe I'm asking this on behalf of all of you and having uh, had investments made <laughs> made into my our company as well. Um, as, a, as an investor, are you looking at quote unquote traction when it talks when you talk about people's knowledge of the product and the services that you are, that that you, your company is about to offer? Or are you looking at the business viability of the company by itself, looking at how the business is operated, looking at what the operational margins are, look at what the operational arbitrage is, looking at what the EBITDA looks like, and you ha as investors have invested in multiple times, you evaluate projects on an ongoing basis for the most part, as a part of your daily life. So having a service company tell you that 1000 is my attraction, that's more than sufficient for me to conduct uh, my business profitably is that the answer to the question you have, or you have to answer what EBITDA is <laughs> no, no. that's some if I, I should I do I have to answer what EBITDA is <laughs> no. EBITDA okay. is just profit after all the back stuff <laughs> See, that's a good, that's a good way of so, so you know um, I think there's two lenses you know there's a lens we wear when we look at a consumer business and there's a lens we wear when we look at an enterprise business and think early stage Sure. So in both cases, I think on the on the enterprise side, you know, we're much more focused on, you know, what 
sort of fundamental problem are you solving in the business context, right? And can you actually go out there? And in India, I think the challenge is not product. We have a lot of people building interesting products. It's actually the channel, right? How do you go engage a bunch of small and mid-sized businesses to buy what you have, right? So I think the focus becomes what will you charge for it? How will you sell it? What will your channel look like? And can you show that people are actually willing to pay for it, right? On the consumer side, the focus has not been as much about uh, necessarily you know, unit economics on day one. It's fundamentally, can you drive adoption, and I think to the point you made earlier, without spending money on it, right? So in that context, you know, when you think about Facebook, it went from zero to 60 million people in 18 months, right? To me, that's traction, right? But I'm not raising that bar. I'm saying go to Comsco and look at the top 50 sites, right? And start benchmarking and you say, okay, I'm not there, I'm not there, I'm not there, I'm not there. But does 10,000 move the needle, right? Does a million move the needle? Does two million move the needle? Within my world, if I'm a digital media property, if my primary revenue model is advertising, if that's how I'm going to make my bread and butter, what scale is relevant, right? Because that fundamentally translates into overall a path to profitability, right? If you're building, you know, India's next big content site, you know, fundamentally you're going to ask yourself, if I cannot charge people for content, I have to get enough audiences here, at what scale will I be relevant? So I think, you know, when we look at traction, we look at two things. One is, can you get people in the door without paying for it? Two, can you get them coming back? And three, if, is there a path to conversion? Right? And what the CAC is. And you know, I think we, so we do at some point, you know, sort of agonize over customer acquisition cost, but I think that's typically more in the context of a Series A. I think at Seed, you're fundamentally saying, look, is this a great experience? Yeah. Right? Am I going to tell my friends about it? And, and most often than not, when I see a company, I call five people and I say, you got to check this out. So I think, you know, we really got to get that, you know, and that's the promoter factor and the case score, which is how many people did you tell about it? And did you say good things or bad things? Right? And that's really what we're looking for. Okay. I think, uh, you know, uh, what fraction means would also differ at different stages, right, in terms of where you're looking at seed investments. And, but I think, the, Vijay, one of the things that would define fraction at the early stage would be whether some of your assumptions are proven with some reasonable re re level of predictability and whether they can be replicated at the next level. So it doesn't mean whether, I mean, if it's, 10,000 number or 20,000 number or 100,000 number doesn't matter. If your assumptions are prone, I think that will give people the confidence that this is something that they can back on. Uh, yeah, so what he's saying is that there's yeah. no numbers, but there's a number around in the sense. Look, if you're a mobile So we we'll get him to spit some number. So don't worry. I think uh, uh, traction is a very interesting thing. I, I, I'll, I'll talk about a story in our early stages. Uh, six months down the line, uh, we were initially this is the second girl. No, 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 no. Uh, this is real people now. <laughs> uh, uh, what, what happened is uh, uh, six months down the line, we realized that we were only doing couponing for all the offline retailers. We realized that hey, uh, e-commerce guys could be being good couponing partners for us because 50 to 60 percent of our customers were guys who were transacting for the first time in their entire life on free charge. So we thought. It's a great way to help e-commerce companies. So uh, I showed up at one of the OTAs, not the number one OTA, but one of the uh, two or three number OTA. And I was talking to the marketing person over there, uh, huge office, uh, uh, we were six of us, uh, and, and I'm just you know, totally mesmerized about their knowledge about marketing and couponing and so on and so forth. So I asked him out of curiosity, uh, sir, how many transactions do you do per day, right? And, and he said, Kunal, we are the number two or number three, and we do 4,000 transactions a day. My heart sank. So he immediately asked me, how many transactions do you do per day? And I was in this dilemma if I should say or not. I said, I'm doing 8,000 transactions a day, and his heart sank. Right, uh, and we are good friends. After that, the point is that traction uh, is a very relative word, uh, and we need to create our own benchmarks. I think what I would say is relative growth to the previous month and the previous quarter is the function of traction, uh, not the market size. Because we can keep talking about how big the market is and all that. If we can see that if the market is moving at five percent and I'm moving at thirty percent or forty percent, I think we are doing right. That's a really good, good answer. Does that answer most people's, people's yeah. question? Does that give you some number? Not yet. Okay. We will we'll try to get that. So when when did you know that you had traction? When you basically told him that you had 8,000 and his heart Actually, that was the meeting when I realized that we are doing something. Because I thought IRCTC is the benchmark. 
right? And I did not know that the number two, number three e-commerce sites don't you, are not even close to IRCTC, right? That was a good thing that I was not coming from the e-commerce industry because I would have given the same excuses, oh, people are not using credit card, debit card, they're scared of fraud and all that, and I would have made myself believe that. Right? I, I was thinking, oh, they are publishing uh, these open statistics every month that 4 lakh people transact on the site every day. Oh, then the number two, number three guys would be doing a lot. I had no clue what how big was e-commerce, right? And I also had experience with working for US companies in my BPO avatar, so I had no India context either. But what I did is, oh, oh I have to benchmark with the largest guy who's talking about the data so publicly. That leads to a very interesting question. So he said, uh, a good way to say traction is if your assumptions get validated. When I meet most entrepreneurs and ask them what is the assumption, they say, I'm next Google. Right? Uh, yeah. Or you ask them, oh, Facebook. Do we have, do we have Facebook. Facebook. Facebook? So you, you tell them, <laughs> what a, uh, apart from Google, anybody? Nobody. Only Google. Right? But is there any startup who's in that space? Nobody. We're the only person. Right? So the assumption is that this is a Google in the making. Yeah. Right? Now that's not going to validate it anytime soon. Correct. So, so what are the safe assumptions as an entrepreneur? You need to get down to ground reality. And if you have to play the devil's advocate to your own self, what are the assumptions that you would try to prove? So, so talk, first starting with uh, what we make as assumptions, I think uh, what I have noticed is most uh, entrepreneurs in their early stage of journeys have total BS assumptions. They do not have data. They are not uh, looking at data and reality. I, I met someone who told me uh, uh, there are more uh, internet connections than televisions in this country, so thereby this my model is so and so. I was like, where is this data source from? Oh, Mahesh Murthy was talking about this in some conference. Uh, uh, he is coming here. Yeah, but I respect him a lot. <laughs> he, he was not saying this. He made the assumption out of this that not it's yet. growing as the biggest screen of this country. That does not mean it's overtaken TV already. The point is that uh, we uh, make these assumptions uh, in an incorrect fashion. Uh, a lot of very few people actually take the effort of going down and finding the market data uh, and we start with some basic premise and uh, internet has become source of truth uh, of some article somewhere uh, I, I don't think that's the right way of doing that second about uh, validating assumptions I think uh, uh, first of all uh, if you have set a goal to do something and be something right uh, you need to define your own goals if you are mattering in the ecosystem is a secondary problem to have first you need to have traction without spending money and being somewhere that people notice you right I think the right way to raise money is when an investor calls you they have amazing tools to find you right they have amazing tool, tools to track your Alexa knowing what kind of they, they talk to pay, payment gateways very well to find out Consi companies other transaction career they'll find you you don't need to go and pitch to them right Means you guys have great uh, systems to find the right companies you don't need to uh, uh, spend all the energies if you do the thing right I can tell you one thing and, and that's the best negotiation platform by the way right because uh, I remember talking to investors and I'm like, I don't need the money. Means, uh, what do I need the money for? He's like, Nene, you have to cover and become the largest. I was like, Nene, this is fine. This is growing at 30% per month. Uh, this is all we can handle with six people. He's like, no, 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 you have to think globally and all of that stuff. So uh, these are the good things when you, when you come to a negotiation table and you say, and you can make any number. I, I'll tell you what, we were offered a, uh, a valuation. He said, no, I think it should be 2x of that. And said, yes. That's exactly what happened. Uh, uh, the, the point is that uh, uh, if you have traction, and traction is something that will demonstrate in your numbers, your spreadsheets will talk about that, uh, your month-on-month, uh, -month, quarter on quarter growth will sh show that the users are coming on board, right? And you don't need to benchmark with uh, uh, these validations that, okay, I'm, and, and as I said, uh, Google, Facebook uh, is, a, is a nice thing, but they all started with the concept of trying to solve problems. So and traction they, is somebody else, as somebody else admitting that you actually have a business. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Is that, is that a good way to put it? So Rahul, I'm going to ask you one question and they're going to ask us to wrap up very quickly. So a lot of people are here and uh, Ty Summit has done a brilliant job marketing saying that anybody can come here and basically collect a check from investors. How true is it as a fact? First of all, are you, collect are you carrying a check book? <laughs> and uh, what has been your experience writing checks? If you meet an awesome idea over here, will you write a check? So I got to congratulate Ty on their consummate marketing skills. Uh, you know, there are a bunch of people running around looking to write checks. Uh, we tend to be more in the bucket of an institutional investor. There's a lot of angel investors here as well. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work like that, right? It, it is not necessarily about, wow, I like that idea, let me write a check. How many, how many companies have you funded meeting in Thai Summit? Um, 
or any conference. Uh, in any <laughs> conference, in any conference, um, a small minority, a small minority. Have you funded any? Uh, I'll have to check on that. <laughs> so, so I think the fact of the matter is that you know, in any in any investment decision, we significantly overweight who we're writing the check to, right? And there is no magic formula to getting to know that person without spending time. And so fundamentally, you know, it's like getting married, right? You, you're not going to get married to the first person you meet unless you went to engineering school and, you know, but anyway, we won't go there. Um, so, 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 so I think, you know, it, it cuts both ways, right? Do not take money from the first guy who offers you a check. Do not. Because unless you've actually checked out the market, you don't know if you're getting a good deal, you don't know if you're actually being priced fairly, you don't know if you're getting the right terms. So what I really encourage people to do is, look, fundraising is a lifelong journey, right? After you raise a Series A, you'll be raising Series B, Series C, Series D. It never goes away. So as a founder of a business, you're, you know, part of your job is build the business, part of it is manage the cash. And that never goes away. So I think the answer to your question is, you know, we take time to build relationships with people we're going to write a check to. Because when we write a check, it's a seven to ten year commitment. And that's not something you take over a cup of coffee. That said, you know, we do value an introduction. So if Vijay sends me a company and says, look, I think very highly about this founder, can you spend an hour with him and tell me what you think? That's the kind of meeting that's likely to lead to the next discussion and the next discussion. So I would say, look, you know, there is different pools of money. If you're raising, you know, 20 lakhs, 50 lakhs, that's seed money. Those are friends and families, maybe fools, but that's a conversation you need to have, and that maybe that gets done over coffee. But when you're raising a million, two million, three million, that's going to take three to four months. It's not going to happen overnight. All right. So last question. Uh, I think if, I, if I may just add to that, I think sure, to sure. his point, if you have a valid business, if you're passionate about it, if you have the conviction with which you're starting the business, the money will follow. And it's not something that you have to go seek out, just uh, just as the example that you said, laid out, it will come to you, as long as you have a valid business model, as long as you have a valid business case by itself. So, uh, very quickly, within half a minute, tell me, what is the, what do you think about pivots? Another fancy word. <laughs> but I think uh, from a, from a, uh, from an entrepreneur's perspective, a pivot essentially is his ability to change direction of the company by itself. Uh, assumptions that you make will continue to change. Market conditions continue to change. Uh, what you need to do is you need to ensure that if you have an investor, that at the end of the day the interests are protected at every given point in time and you have the ability to pivot the business ensuring that all the values that you've uh, you've preserved the values across the board it's not pivot for the sake of hey, another bright idea that's just come to mind uh, first of all i think that's an overhaul there's a difference between a pivot and an overhaul as well sure uh, uh, for me uh, i'll, I'll uh, take this concept back to uh, a psychology concept called as confirmation bias uh, uh, our love of our original idea is dangerous uh, businesses have to pivot at the right time uh, and that's the time you do not have to fall in love with your original idea. Uh, businesses have to pivot. Uh, the timing of that is the skill of the entrepreneur, right? Uh, if you fall in love with your original business idea, uh, they will get disrupted. It's talking about Monster and LinkedIn. The stocks are showing that, right? Uh, 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 or, or Microsoft not creating an app ecosystem and Apple creating an app ecosystem. There are businesses which have to pivot. Uh, uh, it's about the timing, which is the entrepreneurship skills. Uh, but I, as I said, we should not fall in love with the original idea of our business. So, we should be so in love with being can successful. I, can I add one thing? Is, is the one thing that doesn't change the problem that you're trying to solve? Yes, it, it doesn't solve. Uh, the problem, I think you just get to learn the problem better over a period of time. Uh, you start with just scratching the surface and you realize the problem is much deeper into these areas. And that's when you start saying, hey, my business should probably expand to this larger problem or actually go deeper and address in this problem. So in terms of pivot or in terms yeah, of Yeah, so the, should you fall in love with your idea, your product yeah. or the problem? I, I think you should be paranoid, right? I think that's the really, that's the answer. No love? Uh, no love. No. I think that you should be objective about what you're building. I think you should be passionate, right? I'm not saying don't be passionate. But, you know, I think if you don't kind of constantly reinvent, I think you will be left behind. All right. So.